Hi, I'm Marcella Sapone. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Hello Alfred, and you're watching Behind the Brand. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with Marcella Sapone, CEO and co-founder of Hello Alfred. Marcella, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I usually ask my guests, how'd you get this job? <laughs> I made it. Uh, well, I've had a few jobs and you go through this progress of looking for places that you can learn from other people and problems that you can solve. And at some point you get to a place where you want to solve problems you're passionate about. And for me, I really care about finding balance and being the best in the world at things that you do, including play and your personal life. And so I created a company with a friend of mine, Jessica Beck, to make sure that people could come home happy. Yeah, tell us about Hello Alfred and what the, what's the plan? So Hello Alfred is a home management system. We pair people with dedicated help that visits each week and connect you to a large network of service providers who get things done for you. So we're here in New York City, obviously we've got some context and this is where you guys are starting. Um, but break it down, like what are some of the services for those who don't know and um, want to know more? Right. So every week on the weekend, many of us do chores. We do things like pick up our groceries at the grocery store, maybe get some dry cleaning, do our laundry, clean the home. Alfred does that for you. And we connect you with the best prices and the best providers. And we also have the key to your home. So while everyone is at work, we're going into your home and putting things away in your closet. You're coming home to your laundry folded and waiting for you. We help with things like interior decorating and installations and meeting the cable guy, taking your pet to the groomer, almost anything you could think of. Wow. Uh, so do you get comparisons like, okay, hello, Alfred, is the Uber for, you know, chores or, you know, basically your daily activities? We've gotten a few of those. So we have um, Uber for help. Uber for servants, which I don't like at all, and uh, we are disrupting adulthood. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Um, how are you addressing security? I mean, um, we're sort of getting past uh, privacy issues, you know, our lives are living online, but like, how do you get past the security stuff? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that five, ten years ago, none of us would think about having a stranger in our home when we aren't there. But then things like Airbnb um, propped up and with Uber you get in a stranger's car, with Airbnb you rent a stranger's apartment. And this is the next extension of that which is having other people help you get things done uh, and trusting them to care about you and care about your space the same way that you do. So how did you discover the need for this? I mean, uh, was it something personal or did you do research? How did you figure out that this was a good idea? So uh, we built the business for ourselves. I used to work 90 hours a week. I was working in finance. Before that, I worked in consulting. And I wasn't taking very good care of myself. I was coming home to a really messy apartment. I didn't have time to stop at the dry cleaner, so I was buying new shirts every week. Yeah. I didn't have a great personal life. And when I went to business school, uh, my friend and I were thinking about, as women, how we were going to manage our careers. How were we going to be partners? How were we going to have children and, and continue in our career? And so what we did is we reached out to a lot of different people and uh, people who are leaders in media and tech and finance and we said, how did you stay in the workforce? And they all had one shared answer and that was help. And so for us, it was how could we make help accessible to as many people as possible? Trusted help that would do things for you the way you would for yourself. So do these people, you know, like, so if it's people who fold laundry or do your grocery, are, are they specialists in these areas or are they generalists that do everything? The idea is to have a home manager who is a generalist, who uh, is as intuitive and thoughtful as you are. Many times they're stay-at-home moms who live in the neighborhood. Other times they're kind of a creative class who are therapists or writers or painters. And they are there to come in your home every week and start to become a detective and anticipate you. So adding things to the grocery list when we notice that your milk or coffee is out of stock. 
it's really about bringing human intuition to bear, but in a scalable way. Yeah. So how are you vetting these people? Like, is there a training process? Because, um, I mean, you know, security still is an issue. We're seeing now because of the proliferation of Uber and Lyft and other services, some of the problems, you know, like the dangerous aspects of it. Yeah, so we think about security as one of our the pillars of what we're building. Trust is all that we are selling. And so for us, we go through six different filters of vetting to make sure that we are finding the right people. And then we continue to do that vetting through their employment with us. And that includes deep background checks, reference checks, identity checks. Um, as well as auditing and mentorship. And one way to kind of create a community of people that you can trust is to have the community itself regulate. So at the end of the day, our Alfred client managers are making the ultimate hiring decisions. It's not the corporate team. And so there's kind of a guild or a, a, a working group um, that thinks about how to keep the trust levels very, very high. So it's localized then? It's very localized, but it's also centralized. We do uh, have we really are spending a lot of money to make sure that we know for a fact that you are a trustworthy person. Um, it's important to us. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people watch this show. They're entrepreneurs. They have their own startup. Yeah. Um, they're in the struggle. Uh, talk to us about the struggle a little bit, some of the you know, successes and failures that you've had. And I ask that really because people appreciate the hindsight, right? People who are maybe in this mode a um, little bit maybe behind where you are, are looking out for the potholes and they don't want to stumble, you know? Yeah. One thing that I uh, heard uh, recently that I really like is that you should try to teach people the things you've learned before you've forgotten them. So I, I love to share my story and, you know, not everyone has heard of Alfred. We might be a, somewhat of a, a known factor in New York, but our aspiration is to become a household name. Everyone should know that Hell Alfred is the way you get help in your home. Um, but we started really, really simply, which is just with an idea and then a series of questions about whether or not this could make a good business. So yes, I had this need for myself, but that doesn't mean that it would be a big business or a venture-backed business or a business that other people would want to work for. Yeah. So what we did is a, a lot of research and small experiments. We looked on Craigslist for people who were looking for recurring help and we found 35,000 listings in the U.S. In, tops, in top 10 cities. So that was a good indicator. We uh, put out uh, different landing pages and different postcards and kind of put them under people's doors in Boston at different price points and watched people sign up. And then we created an MVP of the product where we hired our very first Alfred client manager. Her name is Jenny. And she serviced um, our first group of customers. And we did that over a course of six months and really let people use the service in any way they thought would be helpful. So we said, ask us for anything, we'll figure out a way to do it, and we'll do it at a reasonable price. Um, then we took all of that research and we put together a business plan. And that business plan was, how do we think about this as a scalable business? And how do the unit economics work? Um, one thing that was very important for us and was a little different than I think a lot of venture-backed businesses is we didn't think about building a human-centric company by growing it as big as possible and then figuring out how to make the unit economics work later. We actually said we we're going to throttle growth and we have had a lot of signups but we don't let everyone start the service until we know that we can operationalize a neighborhood in a cost-effective way. Um, we found venture capitalists who agreed with us on that approach because what it meant is us really investing in our people um, which wasn't something that you know a year ago was a popular thing to do. Right. We're considered kind of in the sharing economy, on-demand economy, um, and there was a little bit of a proliferation of services to not thinking about the human who was powering the platform. Okay. And so we were one of the first on-demand or sharing economy companies that made our workers W-2, which meant a little bit higher cost structure, but has allowed us to bring in quality people that we trust and trust in people's homes. So were you looking at Uber as kind of a case study like, okay, this is where this thing is going and with the pushback against employee versus contractor, you were looking at that maybe as a... Yeah, I think Uber is a, a great case study that many of us who are entrepreneurs look at. We think about how they scaled, how they grew quickly, how they focused on one market, found a formula that worked and kind of scaled that. Um, but also the idea of what doesn't work with Uber and where are their pain points and how you need to adopt a model to change. It's not a one-fit model. Yeah. 
and uh, not all industries work the same way as black cars or um, transportation in general. So you really have to figure out what are the constraints and, and design towards that. So where have you gone wrong? Talk about some of the failures. You know, and, and I ask that again because uh, the F word failure tends to be the stigma. You know, we don't want to talk about it, but the reality is you can't have success without it. Right. Um, where did you go wrong in order to sort of get it right now? Yeah, I think I start with, well, what is our definition of success? And for me, that is having this be a, as high an impact service for as many people as possible. And then from there, we back out into what our goals are. And our first goal was to get funding. Um, so we've closed two rounds of funding. We have $13 million in the bank. Our second goal was to find some great people to help us on our mission to make people come home happy. And okay, we stop right there. Yeah. So you have $13 million in the bank. That's awesome. Um, you came from a finance background, so you maybe kind of knew your way around finance. But how did you go about, where did you go for help and resources first? Did you go to Silicon Valley? Did you go back to... New York, like how did you do Yeah, it's a great question. So there's lots of different places you can go, and I don't think it's just the West or East Coast. Yeah. We got funding on the East Coast. We're a New York-based startup. I like that. I think it means that we are a little bit grittier. If you can make something work in New York, you can make it work a lot of places. Mm -hmm. uh, we spoke to a lot of venture capitalists before we pitched our business, and we wanted to understand what made them tick, what their investment theses were, what the culture of the firm was. Um, and then we pitched it. We got on stage. We got on stage at TechCrunch Disrupt. We won TechCrunch Disrupt, which was a good um, moment for us to get a lot of recognition. Not a bad platform or <laughs> launching pad. It's a great place. Yeah. Um, even though there is a lot, people kind of poke fun at it. You know, the Silicon Valley HBO show is. Uh, uh, they get some things right. Yeah, it's still legit though. Really, it's really legit. I think pitching your business and learning to get on stage and pitch it over and over again, and in conversations with investors, with partners, with potential employees with professors. Uh, there's lots of different places where you can kind of get a start. And then my advice is always to build actual real experiments and try to prove or disprove. So your job as an entrepreneur is to mitigate the risk around your idea and to prove that there is demand and that your model for going after that demand is going to be effective and has barriers to entry. So tell me about some of the mistakes you guys have made. Mistakes is a loaded word. I like to think about mistakes as opportunities to learn and grow, and that's your job as a founder and as an entrepreneur. Um, I think there are four saves that I think about after having been in business um, with a startup for more than a year. Okay. And they have to do with sequencing, scaling, spending, and speed. Um, sequencing and scaling, let's talk about those quickly. Uh, not focusing on fires, but actually thinking about what are the things that are going to have the most impact to allow you to scale as quickly as possible. Scale the business, scale yourself, you need to delegate. You need to stop doing things yourself and you need to start coaching your team to do things. Sequencing is incredibly important. You need to be thinking about experimentation. Instead of just doing all the things, as you're starting from scratch, there's so much to do. But making sure that you have real experimentation and, and kind of sequencing one step at a time. So don't launch all the cities at the same time. Don't uh, hire for four functions at the same time. Uh, do not uh, do things that are at odds with each other that take away resources. Really start to focus on one thing at a time and try to validate or invalidate something. Okay. Spending, being very careful on how you spend your money uh, so that you have as many opportunities to control your destiny and outcome. Fundraising is a constant job and it can be very distracting from actually building the product and building the team. So you need to plan and, and really think about how you're going to put your money to use, how it's the best use. Um, and then speed. So how quickly do you need to get to your next market? How quickly do you need to hit a certain goal? And you need to think about what are the competitive demands? How is the market going to change? And are you building barriers to entry? Because as soon as you put your idea out there, competitors start to crop up, and that creates a lot of noise. And if you are starting a category like we are, you want to be known as the leader in that category. Yeah, first out usually wins, right? Usually. First mover advantage, all that stuff. Exactly. Um, OK, so those are super smart principles. I think that's great advice. Where have you guys taken a misstep? Like, talk about some of the yeah. specifics, so you know, as little case a couple studies. Of examples. Yeah. 
um, not hiring fast enough, and then um, hiring too quickly. So like, what was your first hire? Our first hire was a friend, which is a, lot of, a mistake that a lot of people make. I don't think it is a mistake, they're still with us. Um, but you need to start to bring in people who've done things before to kind of start to have that in your DNA. Okay. Um, Did you bring people from outside the space or inside the space? or? You know? We brought people from inside the industry, so places like One Fine Stay and eBay, um, others from the gaming industry, some from the hospitality industry. Being thoughtful about you wanna, who you want to hire and proactively reaching out to them versus reactive, re, responding to who is applying to you. You should have a point of view on what your team is going to be. I talked about that selection process too. Was it, you know, you wanted someone endemic to customer service or like, you know, I can understand kind of the eBay thing or the gaming thing, but break it down for us. Yeah, so the way I think about it is if you take apart the business into the pillars of the business that you have to build, do you have somebody who's responsible for each of those pillars? Because when you start as a founder, you have every job, and your right. job is to fire yourself from the jobs as quickly as possible. Right. So first, it's how do you kind of break up the work? And before you talk to people, it is so important, I made this mistake of writing down on a piece of paper, paper like the spec for the job, the scorecard. Who are you trying to hire and why? Because what happens is you meet great people who you think would be a great fit, who you'd be inspired to work with, but they don't quite meet the goals that you have for the business. And so it takes a lot of work to realize that and a lot of time it can be wasted in bringing people in who aren't quite right at getting success in the door for the business. Yeah, you know, a lot of people, and Richard Branson's famous for saying this, you know, he doesn't hire on skill, he hire, hires on personality, on character. Right. Are you kind of doing a balance of both of those things? Yeah, it's a balance of both. Yeah. Part of it is thinking through what are your principles, what are the values you have as a business, and does this person have them as well? And having a point of view on what those are. And then others are more about how someone thinks. Are they a logical thinker? Are they good at abstract problem solving? Do they talk with analogies? Are they a good storyteller? Can they communicate? What are you good at? Well, I think that I am known for telling good stories for having a point of view and a vision, and then getting people who are talented, inspired, working for that vision, which is kind of the definition of a founder or a leader, but I actually mean that, having ideas and getting people involved in your ideas. My co-founder, on the other hand, is very good at maintaining and improving a process, and she comes to work every day and makes sure that the ideas that I have actually come to, come to life. So is it complementary? It's very complementary. Yeah. And we might look the same on paper, so a lot of venture capitalists will tell you that when you're finding a co-founder, you should find someone who complements you and is from a different background. But I think you can have two people who both have the same background, whether or not you're both engineers or maybe you both have MBAs. But if the way you think and the way you act and what you do in the world is different, you can be actually quite complementary. So you guys are killing it. Um, things are going great, but like, what's keeping you up at night right now? What are you worried about? What are you afraid of? Um, what are some of these things that you're thinking about down the road? Right. So I'm thinking about how do I make my business as scalable as possible without losing the human touch and without using, losing the customization of the business. Yeah. I think about barriers to entry. Are we making it harder for other people to come and take our lunch? Mm -hmm. Are we spending our money too quickly or, or are we being prudent? We've kind of taken a point of view on having a measured way of growing. So Paul Graham had this saying which was a startup is about growth and growing as quickly as possible. But you have to ask yourself relative to what? So we're in multiple markets in the US and we're less than a year old. That's scaling faster than Starbucks. But I look at other startups and they might be in 10 markets in eight months. And so you have to not really compare yourself to other businesses and, and figure out what's the right rate of growth for you. Yeah, and each market for you guys is going to be different. It requires a different touch. It's a different culture. You know, L.A. is different from New York, right. different from Austin, Texas, or, you know, somewhere in Minnesota. You know, it's even different neighborhood by neighborhood in New York. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Walk us through a day in the life of Marcel. You know, you get up in the morning. What do you do? Walk yeah. us through that. Am I getting regular sleep? Maybe not enough sleep, but am I trying to get the same amount of sleep consistently throughout the week? Am I getting off my phone? Am I putting my phone down, shutting off notifications, and making sure that I actually have time to think? Mm -hmm. Reflection time and being alone and, and, and 
taking a step back and saying, OK, what happened this week? Was I actually successful or not? Where can I improve? There isn't a lot of time to think you're reacting and you're defaulting to your most basic level of training. Um, and especially if you're not sleeping, you're making a lot of quick, reflexive decisions. So it's good to carve out actual times that you're going to maybe meditate on some of your decisions or meditate on what you want to change. Um, are you an introvert or extrovert? I'm actually an introvert. Yeah, me too. What advice would you give to other introverts yeah. who may think? It's really important yeah. to carve out time to be completely alone and to kind of recharge and reset your batteries and to think about batching the types of things that you do. So if you're going to do interviews, do interviews all on the same day. If you are going to be writing, try to get a lot of writing done on the same day. That approach is something that Jack Dorsey uses and Tim Ferriss, and it's worked really well for me as well. Awesome. Yeah, we've had Tim on the show. He's fantastic. He's awesome. Yeah. He's a friend. Um, you know, maybe give some more advice about um, knowing when to quit. Um, a lot of us will have this amazing idea, yeah. but we don't know how long to hang on. How long do you give this great idea until you know it's not working or it's time to move on or pivot or whatnot? Yeah. Uh, so you need to, before you dive in, say, like, this is what success is and get people that you trust to, to weigh in on what success is. Yeah. And then it's about doing experiments to prove or disprove that you are hitting success. So for us, it might be, OK, well, are people paying for the service? Do you have a lot of demand for the service? Are you growing? Are you able to actually do it cost effectively? And if we aren't proving those points, then something's very wrong. And that doesn't mean that you need to quit. It means that you need to change your approach. Uh, being an entrepreneur is really popular. It's even buzzy at this stage of the game, but do you think it's something that we're born with? Is it, in our, is it in our DNA or is it something that we can learn? I think it's a little bit of both. There's different types of entrepreneurs. You can have a lifestyle business and that's actually awesome. You could maybe work on a team, a small team, or you could be someone like Drew Houston and build a thousand person company. And I think having self-awareness about what you're actually good at and not just what you think, but what other people around you think yeah. and being willing to ask and not having your feelings hurt. This like emotional piece of it, managing one's psychology is a really important thing that I think we can all learn and get better at. But I think there are skills that are necessary to be an entrepreneur and necessary to be a leader. Um, so that's things like really being able to take risks and being comfortable with not knowing the answer. Uh, it's being comfortable with getting feedback constantly and putting your ideas out there in the world and not perfecting and kind of keeping the invention and behind closed doors for a very long time. You have to get it out there in the world and get feedback and really iterate and change the product based off of what others think. Were you always good at that or did you, were you always oh, comfortable? No, no, no. no. So, you know, in school I was a perfectionist. I wanted an A on every paper and I would hand in papers and, and finish things literally at the last minute because I was putting every piece of effort into making it better. Mm -hmm. You can't let perfect be the enemy of good. Doing more to prove a point is actually more effective than doing one thing really well. How long did it take you to figure that out? It took me a really long time, and it's something that I learned in consulting. Um, I got to work with lots of CEOs and lots of founders when I worked at McKinsey, and I've seen a lot of leaders also when I worked in finance, and you start to learn it from them, that they need to, you need to simplify things. It's not about being the smartest person in the room, it's about hiring the smartest people. It's not about having the answer, it's about figuring out how to get the answer. And you start to realize that the actual pieces of work are not as important as the direction of where you're going and all of the work and the sum total of that cumulative force that you're building. Yeah. So you stop really like getting too focused on the, the pieces of the work. So just get feedback, put stuff out there in the world. 